Morning, glory, evening, grace, brethren, and sisters. Let's have all of you back along with us here with the Award Bible Institute as we continue to uh, go through the Old Testament uh, survey. And uh, now beginning the uh, the book of Joshua. It's great to have everyone along with us here as uh, <clears throat> oh, I have a little something here on the computer screen. I apologize. There we go. And so we thank everybody for coming back and uh, being with us. Hope everybody has uh, gotten a lot of the course so far. Students uh, reading and doing the coursework, as well as uh, those of you who might just uh, be viewing us uh, here, auditing or whatever, which we certainly encourage anybody and everybody to do that, to uh, learn more from uh, from God's Word. And we thank the Lord for allowing us to meet again. Thank God for letting us get to the Pentateuch, learning uh, so much there from the Pentateuch, and now even more uh, that we can learn from uh, Joshua and the rest of these history books here. And that's, the, that's really the end now, it's history books. And so we thank the Lord for allowing us to, uh, to get into this portion of his word. And thank everybody out there for being with us. And we certainly hope we'll be a blessing and a help to you, as the word of God always is. Amen. And so we'll go to the Lord in a word of prayer, then we'll get started. Our Father, we sure do love you. We thank you so much, Lord, for the goodness of sin. I thank you for allowing us to meet again and to gather in your name to learn your word. Thank you for uh, each student, for this Bible Institute, for all the staff members, each one that takes part, and all the ministries associated with it. I pray that you bless each one. And just to help us all, we pray to be faithful, to do your work and will, and to follow after thee, Lord God. Give us that which we need. May we all be faithful. Uh, may, we all, uh, may we all be courageous as Joshua was, and just follow after you, Lord. Lord, and do great things for you, and bless us and keep us, we pray, Lord, throughout uh, throughout this class, and uh, throughout the remainder of our studies, and uh, throughout our lives and ministries, Lord, for it's in Christ's blessing, and we do pray, amen, <clears throat> and amen. And so now we will look at our introduction, our introduction to the, uh, to the book of Joshua here, of course, we'll do our introduction, and uh, we'll get through at least the first couple of points. We may not get any further than that of uh, this uh, class here. We'll take us at least two, maybe even three, to get through it all. But, of course, we'll get through what we can out of the Word of God. Of course, this is a survey class, uh, so we don't uh, cover everything, but uh, we do bring out the main ideas, and there are some good main ideas here in the book of Joshua, which uh, we even can glean from our introduction here. And so uh, Joshua was the uh, primary writer of this book that bears his name. Some of the references are in the first person plural, like in uh, Joshua chapter 1, verses uh, 1 and 6, for example. It says, we, and so there, you know, with the narrative, it's quite obvious that Joshua was writing that. And uh, Joshua 24, 26 clearly, indicated, clearly indicates Joshua authorship. It's also evident that uh, some material in the book transpired after Joshua's death and the conquest such as like the uh, conquest of Hebron by Caleb, which is in uh, chapter 15, verses 13 and 14, the uh, conquest of Debur by Othniel, chapter 15, verses 15 and 19, and the conquest of Leshem by the Danites in uh, chapter 19 and verse number 47. And so there is a Jewish tradition that the high priest Eliezer added accounts after Joshua's death, and then his son Phinehas added accounts after Eliezer's death, that of course being... Uh, uh, Eliezer being the son of Aaron, the high priest, and then Phinehas, his son, who would have been Aaron's uh, grandson. And so that's just a tr Jewish tradition there, and it is very possible of the authorship there. And then uh, the time there, looking at uh, the time of this writing, Joshua 1.1 1, 1 began around 1395 B.C., shortly after the uh, death of Moses. And then the events of the book span approximately 25, uh, 25 years, with the concluding verses likely being recorded around the early judgeship of Othniel, who was the uh, first judge there mentioned in the book of Judges, which which Othniel's, uh, Othniel's judgeship would have been around 1370 B.C., so the events here we'd say run approximately uh, from uh, 1395 to 1370 B.C. And then the theme here, the main theme of Joshua is victory. That's certainly the main theme here. Of course, like a Joshua mentioned a little bit more in a little bit, Joshua, you know, coming after the Exodus, whenever the people finally did, uh, finally did make the conquest of Canaan. Like a Joshua here was a slave born in Egypt, but uh, through his faithfulness, he left Egypt. He uh, traveled, you know, through the wilderness, and then he settled in the Promised Land. 
uh, like if you remember there, like from the book of Numbers, you know, Joshua was one of the 12 spies that saw the promised land, and he brought back a good report, even though most of the people there did not. He brought back a good report. He was the only one who, you know what, who was, uh, who was faithful, you know, during that time. He really, he really, he really had faith that uh, the Lord could help the people of Israel to, uh, to conquer Canaan. And, you know, even though Joshua had previously been surrounded by immature believers and people that lacked real faith, he remained faithful and God blessed him. So, you know, what a, uh, just what a great picture that is. You know, like you want to do a, do a character study, Joshua would certainly be a tremendous one to do. You know, with all he faced in his life, you know, like we said, he was a slave in Egypt and then even through the wilderness, you know, he wasn't, unfortunately, he was around Moses, who was a tremendous amount of God, and Caleb, who was also a faithful man. But, you know, aside from Moses and Caleb, you know, Joshua was really around a lot of immature believers. He was around a lot of people, you know, that were more worldly minded, you know, like, you know, they're through the wilderness, you know, how they start, you know, worshiping other pagan gods and things. You know, he was surrounded by a lot of people that lacked real faith, you know, people that really weren't truly spiritual and godly like they should have been. But, you know, he remained faithful, you know, and God blessed him for it. You know, like he became a, you know, he became a great leader himself, you know, when he led the conquest of Canaan. And, you know, for the New Testament believer, Joshua is a picture of a mature Christian. You know, he's a picture of a mature Christian being a leader, living a victorious Christian life, experiencing the blessings of God. You know, that Joshua, you know, we have the character trait, you know, of a truly religious, of a truly spiritual man. You know, a man who has true religion and a man who is truly spiritual. You know, a real, you know, mature Christian, you know, that, that's certainly a great need now. You know, that's actually going to lead us right here into our, into our first point here. But, you know, that certainly is needed, you know, having a real, you know, mature believer. You know, those are people that are really rare in this day and time. And with that, we'll get right into our outline. And here in our chapter one, uh, chapter one here. And, uh, starting here in chapter one, number one, no entrance entrance into the promised land. That's number one, entrance into the promised land. Uh, chapter one, verse one to chapter five and verse number 12. Entrance into the promised land. Chapter one, verse one and chapter five and verse number 12. And then we have letter A here, Joshua's commission. Joshua's commission. So picking up there right where we were all, we were all talking about there in the introduction, like it says in verse one, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land, which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses." From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even under the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and under the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee in all the days of thy life as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto the, their fathers to give them. And so like a letter A, we have Joshua's commission. Uh, Joshua's Commission, chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. And, you know, that's exactly what's needed in this day and time. You know, we need more mature believers. You know, we need more people who are spiritually minded. You know, we need more preachers who really believe in God. No, not necessarily, uh, you know, believing in themselves. I know in themselves, I know there's a lot of people who use that, you know, that type of a terminology, you know, for things. And, and uh, but, but it's not so much that you just believe in yourself, but you believe in God. You know that God can do it. You know, like people like among preachers, you know, might use that terminology. You know, how do you think you could be another another Charles Spurgeon or another John Wesley, you know, or another George Whitfield, another George Mueller, etc.? Uh, well, you know, God is still on the throne. You know, we serve the same God that those same great men did. And, you know, my heart, I, uh, you know, I desire another revival. You know, that's really where my heart's at. That's what I want to see because that's what we need. And, you know, God is still God, but what God needs is willing people. You know, he, ne he needs this next generation to step up the way that Joshua did. You know, like after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, now the son of none, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, 
go over this Jordan, thou and all this people on the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. You know, that previous generation has passed away. And, uh, you know, that generation of, of revivals, you know, yes, they were a phenomenal generation. They had a lot of great men of God. You know, it really just wasn't a couple. It was it was quite a few. But, you know, we need uh, we, we need people like that in this day and time. You know, that previous generation has passed away and we need a new generation to pick up and to and to do the work. You know, God is still on the throne and we are still here on the earth. You know, if God still wasn't willing, you know, if God still wasn't willing to do things with us, then we wouldn't be here. You know, the rapture would have already taken place. But, you know, we're still here, though. You know, us as believers, you know, we're still here. You know, God's still saving people. Uh, God's still calling people to preach. You know, God, God's still calling men to be pastors, missionaries, and evangelists. You know, God is still giving people gifts. And what we need are willing people. You know, when God has given us that commission, we just have to live it. You know, we don't need more people that are going to settle for mediocrity and just, you know, go through the motions. You know, we need people who are really going to get with it, you know, who are going to be students of the Bible, who are going to be prayer warriors. You know, like that great missionary William Carey, you know, used to say, you know, expect great things from God, attempt great things from God. You know, we still have to attempt those things. <clears throat> You know, like it says, uh, uh, like it says there in uh, in verse number three. You know, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. You know, everywhere we go, God is going to be with us, just like God was with Moses. God's going to be with Joshua. You know, all from all from this wilderness here. You know, all the way down. You know, all the way going down of the sun. You know, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. You know, yes, you know, for Joshua, going to be a challenge. You know, not going to be easy. You know, it's going to be a challenge. You know, when he faced, you know, he faced challenges. And we will too. You know, you try to do something for God, then yes, you know, that the devil's going to oppose you. The great men that we mentioned, the men of the, of the great awakenings, the devil greatly opposed them. You know, they, they went through a lot of very difficult things, but they were always faithful. You know, and that's what we have to be. You know, we have to be faithful even through those hard times. You know, that God is still on the throne and God can still do, do great things with us and through through us. You know, we have the same God. We have the same commission. You know, the same God that called them men to preach, called me to preach, and called you to preach, if you've been called to preach before. You know, the great ladies that live before, who assisted those men, you know, that that's still the same God. You know, that's what I'm trying to, I try to encourage my wife to do. You know, like for Christmas, I've, uh, I've bought my wife a, a biography of Katharina Luther, Martin Luther's wife. Got her one of Susanna Wesley. The mother of John and Charles Wesley, you know, need more great men, need more great women, you know, women to stand behind them, you know, great women to raise more preachers. You know, that'd be wonderful if a lady would do that, you know, with her children, say no matter what happens, no matter what anybody else does, I'm going to raise my children for the glory of God. You know, I'm going to use this King James Bible to raise my children. That's going to be my textbook, and I'm going to make them as biblical as I possibly can, amen. We certainly need a new generation of ladies that are going to do that. So we see here Joshua's commission. Letter A and letter B. Joshua organizes Israel for crossing the Jordan. Joshua organizes Israel for crossing the Jordan. Chapter 1, verses, uh, verses 10 to 18. And so we see here there is a preparation of the people, like we've already looked at leadership, you know, through godly leadership and also through followership. You know, we've got to follow the Lord, like verse number 17 says, according as we hearken unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. We've got to follow the Lord. Amen. We've got to follow the Lord. You know, especially, you know, as preachers, you know, if you're if you're in a full time ministry, you know, you've got to follow God for your ministry. You know, like uh, I know, like a lot of people, you know, look at preachers and, you know, like people in full time ministries and you know, like church planners, pastors, you know, an evangelist, you know, and we don't really have a visible boss, you know, so to speak, you know, like a visible supervisor. Now, you know, or a manager, of course, I'm a church planner. Now, my pastor is my authority. I have ascending church, Upper Room Baptist Church in Irondale, Alabama. You know, and so in, you know, in a lot of ways, 
you know, I do really, quote, unquote, you know, I have a boss. I believe in pastoral authority. You know, that's just like our church here, what I pray for, what I plan to. You know, if there's other preachers that come out of this church to either, you know, to uh, to be a church planner or, you know, to be an evangelist. You know, the, you know this church is uh, what would, would be their authority. Uh, but, you know, we don't, uh, but, you know, we don't have, you know, like a regular boss, a regular supervisor, you know, like, uh, like, uh, like, like most people do. But, you know, we have God. You know, God is the one that we give an account for. And, you know, everybody must follow God for their life. But, you know, also preachers, you know, that, that is our supervisor, you know, our manager or whatever. You know, we have a supervisor that's always watching, you know, that knows everything we do. We can't hide anything from him. You know, that's why we need to have burning hearts for God to please God. You know, just like uh, just like Joshua here, you know, he was looking at that fellowship of God, the Lord. You know, we must do the same thing, you know, with our ministries and with our personal lives, whatever it is, you know, that we need to do. You know, like a preacher, you know, he needs a strong personal life. You know, I don't, I personally, you know, I don't think a preacher, a, pa a church planner, or a pastor, you know, I really don't think their church is going to be any more powerful than their home is. You know, you want a biblical church, have a biblical home. That's what I told my wife, you know, when we decided to go, uh, whenever we followed the Lord's leadership, you know, to go to northern New York. Yeah, that's exactly what I told my wife. I said, you know, I want to have a biblical church. You know, that was on my heart. You know, the Lord just put that on my heart. I mean, I already had a heart for that, but especially, you know, when we surrendered to go to northern New York. I told my wife, I said, I'm going to I'm going to follow the Bible to a T. You know, I'm going to have the most biblical church that I possibly can, you know, with all my energy. But, you know, you want a biblical church. You've also got to have a biblical family. You know, you got you to start there at ground zero, so to speak. You know, start with yourself. You know, me as a husband, me as a father. You know, I, I need to do what's right. I need to follow the Lord. I need to be a godly man. You know, I need to raise my children for the glory of God, being the man in the home, being a godly husband. You, you know, being godly out in the community and, and certainly then also the church, you know, preaching the word of God right. You know, having the right people in leadership positions, you know, having the right time of, type of ministries. You know, not having a worldly church, but having a spiritual church. And so we certainly, you know, we need to follow the, we need to follow the, uh, follow the Lord and have the right fellowship. So let it be, Joshua organizes Israel for crossing the Jordan. See that we've got to have the right organization, and then let her see Joshua sends spies to Jericho, chapter two, verses one to twenty-four. So we see here, uh, you know, the penetration of the land, and we know here that Joshua, you know, yes, he sent two spies to uh, search out the land, like it says in verse number one. And Joshua, the son of Nun, uh, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, "Go view the land, even Jericho." And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. See there, Joshua sends out two spies to Jericho on a reconnaissance mission. But then also, you know, through one sinner, through one sinner here. You know, that's obviously why we do what we do, to see souls saved. You know, we have a story there about, uh, about, uh, about Rahab in uh, chapter number two. You know, Rahab was initially a harlot. She was responsible for hiding the spies at the eventual destruction of the city. Now notice here the wonderful testimony of Rahab in uh, verses, uh, uh, verses 2 and 3. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither to, to, uh, tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thy house, for they be come to search out all the country. You know, those, though Rahab was a new convert, her life had, had so changed that when the when the threat of the spies was discovered, the king searched her house first. See, God's grace was so wonderful as to allow an ex-harlot to become the great-great-grandmother of King David and an ancestor of the Messiah. You know, she's one of, a, one, of three, one of three Gentiles to be an ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have there the wonderful testimony there of Rahab, a changed life. You know, that's also what we want in our ministries, you know, with, with what we're doing. You know, we have this, uh, you know, we have this conquest, you know, we have this conquest of the kingdom of God. And that's what it includes, you know, it sees, you know, it sees people being gloriously saved by the grace of God, just like Rahab. 
you know, who was a lost Gentile, you know, she wasn't raised, you know, with pure religion. You know, that should be that way with our ministries. You know, we meet people, you know, who've not been raised in a Christian home, who've never heard the word of God before, who know nothing about the truth. But, you know, we give them the truth and they, they get gloriously saved and their life gets changed. And so now here, letter D, Joshua leads the Israelites across the Jordan. Chapter 3, verse 1 to chapter 5 and verse number 1. And we have here the passage of the people. You know, notice that the Jordan River did not separate until after the priest stepped into the water. The verses 15 and 16 of chapter 3. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priest that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam. That is, beside Zaratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. So, you know, why? Well, why is it that, the, uh, that it didn't part until the priest's foot stepped on it? Because God expects our faith to grow. They had to take it. They had to take a step first. See, that's often how to be in our ministry. You know, like God could could call you to do something. And perhaps at the time, you know, you don't have the money to do it. God could have you start a children's home. He could have you start a Bible Institute. You know, he could have you start a widow's apartment or, you know, something else. You know, that, that could be something that, uh, you know, that is financial, that you really don't have the money for something. Maybe you don't think you got the time for. I don't know what it could be, but go ahead and do it, even if you don't visibly see it. Because God expects our faith to grow. Like speaking about that, like with the children's home, like if you know church history, you might know the story. Like I mentioned George Mueller when we first opened. You know, like George Mueller, he started a uh, he started an orphanage for children. He started off just with a few kids, but then, uh, but then, you know, his uh, th that orphanage, his ministry just grew and grew and grew. You know, first he had a little building, then he ended up expanding, having having numerous buildings. You know, housing numerous children. But uh, there, there's a story of one time. One time, though, they didn't have anything to eat for breakfast, all them kids. And George Mueller was a person who never solicited funds for his ministry. Like he never did, you know, like what we as independent Baptists, you know, call deputation, you know, like where you go to other churches, you know, and raise support. You know, he never did anything of that. You know, he never asked another church or a preacher, you know, or anything for any financial help. There's a story, though, of one time. Whenever him and all them kids went there to eat breakfast and they didn't have anything to eat, they ran out of food. And uh, and George Mueller, just being a man of faith, they, they, they say that he prayed about every aspect of his life. He, uh, he told those kids, though, even though they didn't have anything, he said, God's going to provide us something, so we're just going to go ahead and pray. And he bowed his head and he thanked the Lord for the food that was going to come. And it was just a few minutes that passed, and there was a truck that pulled up outside, and it was uh, it was a fella from a restaurant who had a lot of leftover food, and you know they had food to eat, you know, and that's how it is at times. You know, God expects our faith to grow. He just doesn't say, you know, here's the thousands of dollars for you to have a building to do whatever, to start whatever ministry, or or you know, here's you know three people to assist you in the ministry. You know, sometimes we just have to do things. You know, like when crossing, you know, just like whenever the, the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, he parted the waters. Now, he parted the waters before the people began to cross. But see here, though, after the miraculous deliverance from Egypt and the ensuing years of divine protection, God now demands that their faith step into the river before he performs his miracle. Like in verse number 13, And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon in heap. See, like, you know, we, we've seen God do things previously. You know, that, that's another thing here about the book of Joshua. You know, the book of Joshua, you know, is really kind of, a, is really kind of, a, even though it's after the book of Exodus, you know, with Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy in between, you know, Joshua is kind of, you know, is kind of a postlude, so to speak, you know, to the book of Exodus. You know, it's a bit of a postlude, you know, to the, uh, to the book of Exodus. You know, with with a story, you know, and has kind of some of the same narrative. You know, in Exodus, you know, they go through, uh, you know, in Exodus, you know, they leave Egypt. You know, we have the Exodus there. We have the parting of the, uh, you know, of the Red Sea. 
But now here, you know, we have them going into Canaan land. You know, they were coming out of Egypt. Now they're going into Canaan. You know, and before, you know, God crossed the Red Sea before the, you know, before the children of Israel, before anybody stepped into it. But here, you know, they crossed the Jordan after the priest step on it. After the priest step onto the water, it's parted. You know, that's just the Lord, you know, trying to show people some faith. The Lord, you know, showing people, wanting people to show faith there. And that's what we often have to do. And like we said, if you want to do something great for God, you've got to have faith. You know, we walk by faith, not by sight. You know, that's why the Bible says that. Because if you try to do something for God, you know, I promise you, there are going to be times when visibly it looks bleak. Visibly it doesn't look good at all. You know, that's how it was with me, you know, whenever I, whenever I went back into full-time ministry the second time, like after we came down from Canada, I know I've said that before, but, you know, I, I'm a living, you know, I'm a living testimony of that. You know, when we went back into, you know, full-time ministry after, you know, we came back from Canada, I worked a secular job for, you know, a little while, you know, I was out of full-time ministry. Then when I went back in, you know, things didn't look good, you know, things looked bleak. You know, when I first went back in there, you know, in more ways than one, but through our faith, God blessed us. You know, and through that, you know, I got more of a heart for revival. You know, whenever the Lord led us through that, I mean, I had an exploding, exploding heart for revival because God was teaching me faith. You know, that's how the Lord does things. You know, we walk by faith, you know, not by sight. And so we have their letter D, Joshua leads the Israelites across the Jordan, chapter 3, verse 1 to chapter 5, verse 1. And now letter E, Joshua renew circumcision and observes the Passover at Gilgal chapter 5 verses 2 to 12 see like we pointed that that right there out a lot you know that type of principle out a lot you know in the Pentateuch you know there would be time you know whenever whenever people would renew their faith you know whenever people would go back you know they would go over the law and everything you know they would renew the law they would renew the Lord's principles and that's what Josh was doing here because that's something that we have to do you know, that's something that we have to do on a regular basis. We have to renew ourselves. You know, that's why, like I always say, I'm as much of a student of the Bible as anybody. You know, I founded a Bible Institute. I've wrote numerous commentaries, you know, numerous things, you know, about the Bible. You know, <clears throat> at the present time of this recording, writing a Bible dictionary. You know, I've wrote a book about prayer and fasting. You know, I've, I've you know, I've taught Bible college and now I've, I've taught world religions and philosophy at a secular college. But that's something, though, that I do. You know, nobody, I probably, nobody's no more of a student of the Bible than I am. You know, I'm always reading. I'm always going through the Bible for myself. You know, studying not just for teaching or, you know, writing the, per, you know, writing books purposes, but, you know, just for my own personal study. And that's what we have to do. You know, we have to renew the Lord's commandments. You know, we have to do that in our preaching or our congregations. You know, that's what a pastor needs to do to his people. You know, what a church planner needs to do when he starts a church. You know, you have to go over the basics. You know, it's, it's good to go over, you know, elementary things. You know, go over the Lord's commandments. You know, go over living holy. Like I said, you know, they observe the Passover at Gilgal. You know, observe those things that we are supposed to observe. You know, as New Testament believers. You know, don't neglect your own personal devotions. Like, like I, may have, uh, I may have said this before while teaching OT survey or, or another class here. But like, there's a story of an evangelist, a man who was a great evangelist. He came out of a Bible college in the Carolinas, a, a, a pretty, uh, you know, a pretty familiar Bible college. I'm going to say which one. But, you know, he came out of a Bible college and was like a poster boy for that college. Like I said, an evangelist, powerhouse preacher, you know, powerhouse preacher. But he fell off into sin and got out of the ministry. And he tells everybody that he meets, you know, and he, he lets other people say it. You know, like he tells people like, 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 like what happened. And he tells that individual, say, if you want to, you know, you can go tell other people I'm not in the ministry anymore. It's because I simply neglected my own personal devotions. You know, I thought I was just so close to God and so great, you know, as an evangelist, you know, I didn't need to read the Bible every day. You know, I, I didn't need to pray every day. You know, I, I didn't need to do my own personal devotions. But that's exactly why I got out of the ministry, because I just thought I was so great that I didn't have to do that anymore. But we do. And, and you know, when you want to get closer and closer to God, the more and more devotions you do. You know, that's why I study so much. You know, that's why I pray so much. You know, when I have a powerful ministry, stay in the Word of God. Stay in prayer. 
you know, yes, I know we have, you know, other responsibilities. You know, you can't necessarily do that 12 hours out of the day every day. You know, it might be good to do that every once in a while. Maybe, you know, just take a day and fast and do nothing but pray and read the Bible. And a lot of people have families. You know, we have spouses. You know, we have children. I mean, you know, even in the ministry, you know, we have other responsibilities. We have to go visit. Uh, you know, we have to go to hospitals and see people. You know, we've got to go out in the community and, you know, do what God's called us to do, you know, etc. Although, pray much, though. You know, pray much. Stay in the Word of God as much as you possibly can. And so now, number two, this will probably be as, yeah, this will be as far as we get to today. We've already been going about 30 minutes here. Wanted maybe to get a little further, but, you know, this is such wonderful stuff here. You know, we, uh, we have to go over it. Uh, number two here, we have Israel's central campaign. Israel's central campaign, chapter 5, verse 13, to chapter 8 and verse number 33. And letter A, the conquest of Jericho. The Conquest of Jericho, chapter 5, verse 13, to chapter 6, and verse number 37, uh, verse number 27, verse number 27 there. And now we look here, you know, look at the method, look at the method of what they did here in conquering this land. We see here, spiritual victory comes by faith, not by human wisdom. And, you know, this here, this is a, a you know, this is a good, a good sequel you know, like a good sequel for what we were saying before, you know, like about, you know, there with the, uh, you know, there with the Jordan River, you know, the way they had to first step onto the land and then it was parted because our victory, you know, certainly spiritual victory, it comes by faith, not by human wisdom, you know, you know, things that God wants us to do, you know, it may not look good, you know, visibly, you know, it, it may look, you know, it, it may look impossible. But, you know, uh, but, but, you know, whatever the Lord tells us to do, you ought to do it. And the outcome's going to be a lot worse if you don't. Because, see here, marching around the walls of a city was, militarily speaking, ridiculous. You know, I was in the Navy for four years. You know, I was in the military, and they never taught us to do anything like this. You know, that they never, ever, you know, taught us to march around and, you know, blow trumpets and sing or anything. You know, you're going to war. You know, you're using, you know, you're using weapons. You're using an M16 a nine millimeter, you know, and here, you know, they had swords and things that they should have used, but, you know, the Lord told them to walk around, you know, the city, so that's what they did, like, you know, chapter 6, verse 6, and Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said unto them, take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, you know, as crazy as it appeared, notice that Joshua didn't even question his orders, he simply obeyed. Now, that's what we ought to do there, is just obey. You know, just obey God. Don't question God, whatever God does. You know, kind of like another story with Job. You know, when all that first happened to Job, you know, Job didn't even question God. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that Job understood everything, like I'm sure Joshua here, you know, as well. I'm sure he didn't understand everything. You know, Job, you know, when he lost his children, his house, his cattle, his servants, you know, all his wealth, everything he had. You know, he never questioned God. He just said, the Lord give it, the Lord taketh away. Once again, it's not that he necessarily understood everything, because he was just a human. But, you know, he kept his character. He knew the Lord had a purpose for all of it. Same here with Joshua. You know, he didn't even question the Lord. He just, you know, obeyed. You know, he simply obeyed. He just did it. And that's a great thing to do. You know, God tells us to do something. Results are up to God. You know, results are up to God. You know, God God tells you to start a children's home or a, or a Bible institute or, or, you know, something of that nature, some type of ministry, you know, a food bank. You know, you may not even necessarily, you know, have a lot of people that take advantage of your food bank or, you know, or the, or the Bible institute that you start. Or you may only have a couple of kids in your children's home or whatever it is. But, you know, results are up to God. You know, same, you know, with starting a church, you know, especially a church, you know, especially, you know, in a lot of difficult places, I know. You know, where it can be difficult, you know, to have people to get in when you go to places that are, you know, economically prosperous and, you know, there's not a lot of interest and things of a spiritual nature, of a religious nature. But, you know, if God calls us to do it, then do it. Just like Joshua, he simply obeyed. You know, and that's, you know, that's how a lost world sees faith. You know, they see the faith of a Christian as ridiculous. You know, unfortunately, you know, that's just like a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of half-hearted Christians. But, you know, that's why they're half-hearted. You know, half-hearted Christians, you know, have never done anything for God. You know, they've never, they've never took a major step of faith. You know, back when I went into full-time ministry, you know, there were half-hearted Christians. Well, some, 
some, some of these people probably were saved, which I think some of them were lost. But, you know, even with a lot of people that, you know, a lot of Christians, you know, who were, you know, who were like the believers, you know, of, 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 of Joshua's time previously, you know, like through the, you know, like through the book of, you know, numbers and all, you know, who were half-hearted people, you know, a lot of half-hearted people, you know, that they, they will question, you know, what you do. If you have a strong walk with God, you step out on faith and do something. You know, even a lot of shallow, you know, half-hearted Christians won't understand what you do, but especially the world. You know, the world's going to look at your faith, you know, as ridiculous for doing things. But that's the method, though. You know, spiritual victory comes by faith, not by human wisdom. You know, and our methods are different. You know, our methods are different. You know, numbers, you know, like especially, you know, financially and all, you know, things may not add up. But, you know, that's faith. And then also here we see the message, you know, the message of what's in this here. You know, why, why would a loving God order the complete destruction of all the inhabitants in Jericho? Now, God, you know, he has a twofold message here. You know, God, God has a twofold message about this thing here. You know, first, you know, it's God's holiness demands judgment. Now, if you've been in church any amount of time and all, you probably, a lot of this probably isn't really anything new. But, you know, God's holiness, you know, demands judgment. You know, it still does even now, you know, did in the Old Testament. You know, still does, you know, in the New Testament. You know, people reap what they sow. You know, people are judged for their sin. You know, whenever society reaches a certain point of perversion... You know, God will bring about his judgment. You know, that already happened in Genesis 19, you know, with the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah in that surrounding area. You know, Canaan was popu you know, was populated, you know, by ungodly people, by people who even did human sacrifices, you know, people who sacrificed their children, you know, you know, you know people who were uh, who were sexually immoral, you know, with lots of, you know, lots of adultery and, you know, fornication, you know, homosexuality and, and probably even bestiality and all. So, you know, first there, God's holiness demands judgment, but then also God wanted to keep Israel as pure as possible for as long as possible to assure the purity of the ancestry of Christ. You know, going all the way there down to the ancestry of Christ. You know, like we already mentioned Rahab is in his ancestry. You know, if Mary had been an immoral woman, God could not have used her. But see also, you know, the Lord's people, they have to be pure. You know, the Lord didn't want any Canaanites, you know, around his pure people. You know, just like still us as New Testament believers. You know, we're people who, you know, who have to be mature. You know, we have to have a strong walks with God. You know, that's why it's so important. You know, for us, you know, to not let any sin, you know, in our life. Like we're going to look at a little bit more here. Like I talk a lot, you know, about, you know, the church. You know, why it's very important, you know, not to put, you know, unqualified people, you know, in leadership positions in your church. You know, then in our personal lives, you know, things that we have in our house that we watch on television, you know, our music or, you know, even, you know, our spouses and our children. You know, especially as men, we have to be the leader of the home and keep wicked things out of the house. <clears throat> so that's letter A, the conquest of Jericho, chapter 5, verse 13 to 627. And then letter E, the campaign against I. The campaign against I, the initial campaign, chapter 7, and uh, verses uh, 1 to 5. So like uh, verses uh, 5 and 6 here. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua ran his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord, and the eventide he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. Joshua said, Alas, O Lord, verse number 7, God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side Jordan? O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? So down there to verse number 10. The Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Verse 11, Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. So they, so we have here, let her be the campaign against I. You know, it didn't happen. The Amorites uh, took them out. But then let her see, you know, that's what happened. There was sin in the camp. Let her see the sin and punishment of Achan. The sin and punishment of Achan. See, we have here a money-hungry man. 
who risked not only his life, but also his family. Well, see, they had a command, as we were just saying here, they had a command to be separated. They weren't supposed to take anything from Jericho, but Achan took something. Like, uh, you go back to chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and golden vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. See, before there was, see, before the first stroke of judgment ever falls, God informs his people as to what is expected of them. See, Action knew better than that. He was told what to do. But you see here, they were contaminated with sin. See, the, one, the sin of one person touches all. Little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. See, one person can hinder a nation or a revival in the church. One person can be a hindrance. Like we read there how there was sin in the camp. You know, the verses 10 and 11 of chapter 7. You know, because of the sin of, of Achan, you know, the Amorites defeated them. Then we also have there, you know, the chastening of God. You know, Achan and his whole family, you know, had to be stoned. Even though Achan's family didn't do it, Achan was the man of the family. See, God will guard his holiness by chastening a believer even to the point of death. Even in the New Testament, like it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. See, and also, you know, like I was just previously there saying, like I, like I often say here, you know, that's why we cannot have unqualified people in leadership positions in a church. You know, that is one reason why, even in independent fundamental Baptist churches, you know, why they are so dead. You know, because we have half-hearted people. You know, we have half-hearted people who are in leadership positions in a church. Like I said, back when I went into full-time ministry, you know, one of the individuals that was criticizing me was a man who was in a leadership position at an independent fundamental Baptist church. Not my sending church, but another, but another church. Because, you know, that man, I know that man personally, because that man simply isn't spiritual enough to understand what I was doing. You know, he is not, simply is not really a spiritual man. That's a man who should not be in a leadership position in a church. You know, like I said, I know him personally. I know his children. You know, he allows his children to do things that, you know, that uh, that, that no Christian should, especially somebody in a leadership position. He lets his children watch filthy movies, listen to filthy music. And, you know, do filthy things. You know, he has a, I know nobody's perfect. I'm not trying to sound like a holier than thou. But, you know, that simply isn't a man that should be in a leadership position in a church. You know, especially a church that's supposed to be a Bible-believing, you know, fundamental church. And see there, we see the sin of Achan. You know, that's what happens whenever you have people, you know, even in your congregation. You know, like I said, you know, I guard the door even of church membership. You know, people want to join the church. Yeah, you get a clear testimony of salvation from them. But, you know, also, you know, part of their testimony should be why they want to be a member of your church. You know, they want to worship. You know, why do they want to be a member of a strong, fundamental, Bible-believing church? You know, they want to worship with us. You know, they want to be in service with us. You know, a church is more than a social hall. You know, yes, fellowship is a part of a church, but, you know, that's only a, you know, a portion of it. You know, we go to church to worship, you know, to get fed, to be better servants of God. You know, us as a church, you know, we serve together. You know, you want to be a member of this church, you know, to, you know, to hear good, strong Bible preaching, to help you live a holy life and to serve with us. You know, to serve with us, to go to the highways and the hedges, you know, and reach people. You know, that's why, you know, I know they're, that they're in, a, they're in a lot of churches that have that type of standard, even for their membership. But you see, that's why it's so important, you know, because, you know, just getting more people and getting numbers, you know, isn't worth it. You know, yes, you know, I could easily do that, you know, just lower my standard and have, you know, just about anybody join this church that wants to, you know, have anybody in a leadership position you know, that wants to be a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, an usher, etc. But, you know, the Word of God puts qualifications on those people. You know, we need people in our churches, you know, in leadership positions who are spiritual. You know, who are truly spiritual people who live holy, separated lives, who love God. You know, who love the Word of God, who love service, who love God's holiness. 
So we say the sin and punishment of A of Aiken, letter C, and then last turn will be through. Letter D, the campaign against I completed. See what happened when they got sent out of the camp. Chapter 8, verses 1, and 30, 1 to 35. All right, that, uh, that was completed. And they were able to accomplish what they needed to accomplish there. They conquered the Amorites when they got the camp cleansed. And that's what we need to do, amen. That's God's standard for us. God does not tolerate sin. God doesn't tolerate rebellion. You know, we saw that in the book of Numbers. That's why so many of that generation didn't even get to go into the promised land because of rebellion. See, we need people in leadership positions in our church who live holy, who live clean. You know, that's simply what's needed here. You know, like I talk about a revival. You know, those are the type of people I want in my church. You know, people who want a revival. You know, people who are going to be faithful. People who are going to live holy, clean lives. Who love God. Who are going to do things God's ways. You know, who are going to follow the word of God to a T. Not that, no, not that anybody is going to be perfect. No. But, you know, we need people with clean hearts. With pure hearts for God. You know, that's just the focal point of where it's at. You can tell that. You can tell when somebody has a heart for God. You know, if you have a walk with God yourself, you can see when somebody's fired up. You can see when somebody wants to live right. And so those are the people that we certainly need here. Amen. And so thank you so much for being with us. And we'll continue this great book next class. Thank you so much for being with us and for your kind attention. And I hope everybody out there gets a blessing from it. You know, what is so much needed is that next generation. You know, we need faithful people. You know, we need faithful preachers. You know, we need faithful laymen. You know, we need faithful people, you know, in that love God, that are in Bible-believing churches, amen. If we ever want to see another revival, that's what it's going to take. You know, have people in your church that love the Word of God, that love holiness. I want to see the Lord move, amen. And we'll close in prayer. Our Father, we sure do love you. Thank you so much for the goodness of sin, for allowing us to come back and to gather in your name. And I pray that uh, you would just bless us. We pray, keep us, you know, make us strong like Joshua, make us courageous, make us godly, make us holy, and just to help us all live for you, Lord. Bless our churches, our ministries, each one that takes part. I pray we'd be faithful to the Word of God and what the Word of God would have us to do. I just bless your people as our prayer, Lord God, each student, each one that takes part here, each each listener that we have, each one that views uh, these uh, these lectures. I pray they get blessings from them and just help us all to be faithful, Lord, to do your work in will. And we'll be up to give you all, and all the praise and all the glory for all because you're of it, Lord. For it's in Christ's blessing and we do pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much for being with us, folks. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I am Dr. Cooper and I love you and I appreciate you.